Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Facebook Live webinar. I'm Dr. Elise Pellmutter. I'm the Chair of Behavioral Health and Addiction Services here at Bergen Newbridge Medical Center, and I also happen to be a child and adolescent psychiatrist. Um, before we start, uh, just full disclosure, I'm sitting in my favorite room in this hospital, our beautiful administrative boardroom, and I have two of our lovely senior staff members here, but they're at the end of a very long table. We're about 25 feet apart. So although I do wear a mask here all day, I'm gonna take it off now for the duration of our discussion so that you can uh, hear me a little bit more clearly. Here we are at month five in the pandemic, five months. I'm, well, I'm betting that for many of us, it feels like five years, it's an eternity. And we've been through the end of the winter, the spring, and now we're hard to believe closing in on the end of the summer. And many of us have dealt with our children and their concerns about the health of their loved ones, the health of their friends, and the fact that we've been in a sort of lockdown, more or less for five months. It's affected school, it's affected play, it's affected families, it's affected jobs, it has affected every aspect of our life. So I thought that as we move into the end of summer and face the beginning of school, whatever that looks like, it might be a good time to regroup, talk to some of uh, you in the community who may have questions or concerns or things to share about the children what do we say to the kids? So these are this is just a few words about my background. I'm, as I said, a child psychiatrist. I came here just a year ago to take over as uh, the chair of psychiatry and work with the residents. Uh, I interned in pediatrics at Mount Sinai. It was child training uh, with a residency also at Mount Sinai in New York, followed by a child fellowship at Columbia University. Um, I've had a number of leadership roles and I'm a clinical associate professor of psychiatry and behavioral science at George Washington University in Washington, DC. So I've had a lot of experience dealing with children in the face of trauma and disaster, more specifically after 9-11 and Hurricane Sandy. The major principles that affect children and adults are really the same issues for all age groups. And it's not very shrinky. It's really the first, the first consideration is to meet common basic needs. People have to have food, they have to have water, they have to have shelter, they have to know where their family is, and if necessary, they need medical attention. That's across the board. It's the first thing that's taught in learning how to deal with disasters. Uh, not just of physicians, but of any emergency response group. In a disaster or some traumatic expen uh, experience like the COVID-19 pandemic, the size of the psychological footprint is far bigger than the size of the medical footprint. So what do I mean by that? Think about a disaster, think about a hurricane, think about 9-11, think about the pandemic right now. There are definitely medical issues and they are addressed. The coronavirus has left us with some big challenges, uh, things that we are learning about every day for those of us who um, look at the TV, listen to the radio or read the newspaper or on our social media feeds. But it is finite to a point that we are treating it, we are learning how to treat it, and hopefully one day in the nearer rather than farther future, there will be a vaccine. That would be the medical footprint. But the psychological footprint, the effects that go along with a disaster or a trauma, in this case, the pandemic, can go on for much longer there are studies, for example, in some of the now young adults who were children at the time the, the, 
of, of, of the Trade Center disaster, the 9-11. And to this day, they still suffer from the psychological effects of what happened then to their family and to New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, as well as the country. So it's important to remember that although we might have a conversation about, oh, your fever, oh, your fever is better today, and it probably is, but the fear of the concerns about the unknown and what will happen in the future and some of the behaviors or symptoms can last far longer. And that's important to know as we move through time uh, and respond to our children's needs. This next slide, I thought is a lovely slide that was provided by uh, the Uniform Services University of Health Sciences in Bethesda, Maryland, where they have their Center for uh, Stress and Trauma, because it's a nice summary slide of some of the psychological and behavioral responses that people will, ma will manifest, will show when there's a disaster, such as a pandemic. First of all, there will be a distress reaction. And what is that? What are some of the ones that we see? And although our talk tonight is really about children, remember we are not immune either. And we can experience some of these same things. There can be problems with sleep, a decreased sense of safety and unease, physical symptoms. And I'm not talking about the actual symptoms of COVID-19 illness. I have a headache, I have a stomach ache, I don't feel well. People can be irritable and be angry. And there can also be a sense of distraction and isolation. Some of the symptoms or diagnoses that are typical of psychiatric disorders can develop and overlap. We see depression, we see post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and certainly complex or complicated grief. So many people have lost loved ones and some have difficulty dealing with that, some have not dealt with it yet, and it will be an ongoing process. There can be what we call health risk behaviors, alcohol, tobacco, the use of prescription medications, maybe not so much in younger children, but we know that teenagers will experiment under the best of circumstances. So it's important to understand that the stress of a disaster can really bring this out. Families can be in distress, having difficulties uh, in relationships, in some of the regular routines. There can be interpersonal conflict and violence. And one of the things that we have learned in the last five months is that the rate of domestic violence has gone up tremendously uh, during the lockdown. Certainly for pretty much everyone, I would say there's a disrupted work and life balance because even if someone is working from home, that's very different. If you're sitting there in front of your Zoom meeting and you have your five-year-old running back and forth playing with the dog, um, that can be disrupted. And certainly, as we all know, there's been a tremendous restriction on our activities and our travel to keep us safe. These all overlap, but if you look at the big purple circle on the left side of the screen, and it's larger than the others, and it's larger for a reason. We also know that at the heart of it, people, for the most part, are generally resilient and will be able to cope. So let's talk about children and teenagers. What do we see under this sort of stress? When there's separation from primary attachment figures, parents and caretakers, when there's parental distraction and preoccupation and worry and strife, as there certainly is for many, many families during this pandemic, when, there are, when there's disruption in schedules and routines, which, which children really, really need. We all need routines, but children especially. Um, when we're afraid of the unknown, of what's happening, and we, and we don't feel safe. There's a tendency to blame oneself, to feel helpless. Children will often regress. Think about 
your kids when they were very small and they were learning how to walk or they were learning how to go to the potty or they were doing things when they were in first or second grade and they had to go into the hospital for a brief stay, say for an appendix removal, an appendectomy, or to have their tonsils removed, something that we wouldn't think of as terribly stressful once it passed. What we often see in children is that they'll regress, that the last milestone they acquired will be the first one to go. If somebody finally put that thumb underneath the covers and stopped thumb, su thumb sucking at night, in that hospital bed in the peds ward, you'll see that thumb right in and somebody's just chomping away. It all goes away and they get back on their, their track for developmental uh, milestones. But it's not surprising to see that. Another thing, obviously, we see if youngsters are upset, distracted, frightened, is a diminished performance in school. Now, I, when I was preparing this talk and I looked at the slides, I was almost laughing because aside from all these other things that can be stressful, the children's school has been disrupted. They've been at home. Some of them are on uh, online. Some of them are on phone. It's not anything like the routine of their classes and their teachers. When children are feeling these things that I've spoken about, they can also become aggressive. Uh, they fight with their peers, maybe more so than they usually fight with their peers. They can strike out at their parents. Who, nobody's safer than to, to, to strike out at mom and dad because they love you regardless for the most part. Um, but it's something to be aware of. And they can blame themselves. Oh, if I was better, if I was, a, if, I, if, I was if, I, if I listened to mommy and daddy, then we wouldn't have had the coronavirus here in America. Sounds crazy, right? But that's how very small children think. Everything gets personalized and internalized. And the reason I think this is such an important slide is for people to put a name to what they're seeing in some cases. Does every child or teenager respond like this? Of course not. But we know that this is generally um, a set of behaviors or responses that we see in, in that age group. And so I think it's also important for parents to kind of look at it and see it so that they don't get discouraged because, you know, tonight our talks about the children and the adolescents, but we're experiencing some of these stressors as well. You know, you know, this is the saying that we've seen everywhere. We're all in it together. Well, we are all in it together. We're experiencing it, whether we like it or not. So it's important to understand because, you know, knowledge is power. And if we understand the behavior, it becomes much easier to help our youngsters and deal with it ourselves. So let's talk a little bit more about some of the details of uh, how children react to something traumatic like the virus. And I do want to thank our marketing and PR department for the fabulous pictures that really updated some of these slides because I think they're very evocative. Children are fearful for their self. Am I going to get sick? Am I going to die? They're fearful about their parents' safety. Are you going to die, mommy? Daddy, are you going to get the virus? Are you going to leave me? There's what we call separation anxiety. Children can become more and more anxious with some of the behaviors that we spoke about when they're separated for any length of time from a parent or caretaker. Now, that happened in 9-11, certainly if there was a loss of a parent, but also um, sometimes children had to stay with other people. And we saw a lot of that. We're going through that now. Uh, as some family members are hospitalized with the virus um, and you can't see them. Now the technology is different all these years later than in 2001 and we do have FaceTime and we do have Zoom and we have um, some of these things, but it doesn't make up for not being able to be there. When children are frightened and fearful 
about all these things, their own, their own health and safety and that of their family, it's easy for them to be less trustful of adults. But mama, you promised I would always be okay. You promised daddy you wouldn't get sick. These are hard things to hear and get you right like a knife. But the important thing is to understand where it's coming from. There can be the refusal to follow routines. No, I'm not going to bed. I want another glass of water. I want another story, right? Sound familiar? Temper tantrums. And certainly with some of the older youngsters, uh, the tweens or the teenagers, a lot of these feelings get played out in what we would call antisocial behaviors fighting, maybe stealing, doing things that are not really appropriate. They also can have, as can adults, what we call vegetative or physical signs and symptoms, such as disturbance of sleep and eating disorder, eating, eating, either eating too much or too little, uh, but something that deviates from the norm and what's normal for them. They might be more withdrawn pull back, more reticent, and not really engage. Or as we spoke about a few minutes ago, we see regression. And the important thing to remember is that I'm giving you a general overview of how children can respond. What's really the important takeaway message for this is to look at these, this list and measure your children's response against, against it because what, we want, what you want to really be aware of is if there is a deviation from what is normal for them. That's the time to, to listen more closely. So as a child psychiatrist, what I tell all my trainees, um, the pediatric trainees, the psychiatry trainees, the child psychiatry trainees, and all the students, is that if you think about one word for child psychiatry, the word is development because everything we do in understanding how children behave and how they think and how they grow, it all is related to how they develop. Because you know, those of you listening, and I hope you'll write in some questions, you know that your three year old behaves and thinks and understands very differently from your 10 year old who thinks and behaves differently from your 18 year old because there are different age related hallmarks. So briefly, just to review, we view infancy zero to two and a half years of age, preschool two and a half to six, school age um, six to 12 years of age and adolescence 12 to 18 years of age. But I'm guessing many of you have young adults who you believe are still adolescents. So for in infancy, the main thing is the consistency of a caretaker when possible um, and consistency of routines. So with everybody quarantined in one house or one apartment, it's still important that if there's an infant to keep that baby's routines intact. Because how will an infant manifest these stressors? Crying, cranky, sleep disturbance, all of those kinds of things. Then we get to the munchkins, the preschoolers. That's the group who believe the world is here for them. It's all about me in a good way. They have what we call magical thinking. The fancy term is associative logic. Oh, I really wish grandma was here and then grandma walks in, um, I thought it, so I made it happen. Uh, knowing that is very useful because if you have a preschooler who at home in the middle of the pandemic, some of the things that they might say might be very upsetting to you. Oh, I was thinking about the fact that I didn't wash my hands when I came in from outside and that's why daddy got sick. Well, no, but it's important to understand what magical thinking is and how it can impact on a youngster's demeanor um, and behavior. 
This is also the group that has what we would call body image anxiety. Um, and that's not the same as wanting to be beautiful in your lovely teenagers, where body image is also very important. This is an age um, where if someone gets a cut or has an operation, they have very genuine fears that their body integrity is going to be compromised. You know, you could be, you could be a six-year-old in the hospital, say, for a tonsillectomy or a repair of a laceration, but you're afraid you're going to lose, if you're a little boy, you're going to lose your penis. And it sounds very crazy, but at this developmental stage, these are the things that preoccupy this group. It's also important to understand that at this age, children perceive death as reversible. So if there is a tragedy and there's a loss from this virus in someone's family, it's not unusual for a four or five year old to say, oh, but when are they coming back? And it's heartbreaking. It's very hard for a parent to have to repeat over and over again, they're not coming back. But it's also important for you as parents to understand that this is not an atypical response because it can be extremely upsetting and stressful for a parent to have to repeat this over and over again. So some of the typical responses that we see in this group are regressive behaviors. Some sucking at bedwetting after they're, they were dry. Um, it's important not to punish because it's symbolic of the stress and it will improve. These children can also be very clingy you're on a Zoom meeting with your, you know, your, your, your work group and they're crawling on your lap. There also can be a tremendous fear of being separated from a parent, crying, trembling, kind of aimlessly agitated, even when you're all at home. It's also very important to remember that whether it's the pandemic or something entirely different, children of this age are enormously sensitive to parents' reactions they really pick up on it, which doesn't mean that you don't react, you're a human being, but to understand what some of the youngsters responses may be. And so the explanation can be something like, well, things are kind of messy now and we are upset, but you know, this won't last forever and they will get better. And we're not gonna be worried or sad forever. We will feel better and talk about things that they like um, that are important in your family, and that will happen again in the future. Then we get to the school age crowd, each ages six to 12, up through about sixth grade. The developmental hallmarks of this age include mastery of skills, learning to swim, learning to play a musical instrument, um, you name it, sky's the limit. Logical thinking, causal logic as opposed to the magical thinking that all of the younger child. At this point in time in the youngster's development, there's an appreciation of others' points of view. They can understand how somebody else might feel. Beginning of empathy. There's also an increased awareness of actual danger. And it's at this point in a child's life where there's the concretization of the concept of death as being irreversible. And that's important to know as well as we learn about people who have died during this pandemic and possibly relatives who have passed. What are some typical responses? Regression, irritability or temper outbursts, school refusal, refusal to sit in front of that computer screen. I'm not gonna do it and performance deterioration. Trouble with concentration is always problematic because we wanna help the kids focus, stay on track so that they can also, besides progressing academically, so that they can feel good about their achievements. And just like everybody else, sleep disturbance, including nightmares. Some of the emotional disturbances that we see include depressive symptoms, worried, anxiety, um, flatness, like a kind of a lack of emotion just kind of being dull and appearing to be disinterested and withdrawn. We're discussing the problem, these problems with this age group. Um, 
one really needs to be truthful. If there's, excuse me, if there's a loss, Uncle Joe isn't coming home. He got he's very sick and they worked very hard in the hospital, but the virus was too strong or something to that effect. But when I say discussion, I mean discussion, not just a statement of fact and that's it, but to really leave it open so that youngsters can ask questions and they may have to ask the same thing over and over again. For teenagers, the developmental, the developmental hallmarks are, as you would uh, suspect, more sophisticated, uh, more complex, because it's at this age that youngsters really develop the capacity for abstract thought and reasoning. There's an emphasis on autonomy and sexual growth, of being sexual beings. And thinking back, I'll bet to your own adolescence, Kids want to appear competent and create an identity separate from their parents, and that's what they're supposed to do. Physical attractiveness can be a major component of self-esteem. And certainly there's an understanding of death as final and inevitable. So possible responses to the pandemic at month five can be similar to adults with sleep disturbance, nightmares, flashbacks, um, what we call emotional numbing. And what that is, what that implies is that the feelings, the emotions associated with this can be so overwhelming, so difficult to experience that they get virtually shoved to the side um, and they're not really experienced at all. There can be avoidance, depression. And in this age group, we've seen some substance abuse. I've seen some youngsters in our outpatient clinic here who are starting to experiment with alcohol and drugs where they didn't do it before. Um, and social decline. Of course, the social aspects or the lack of the social aspects of this disease make normal social interactions for everybody very, very challenging. Somatic complaints are common. And it's important to ask if a youngster, if your youngster is depressed or angry or any of the things that we're talking about, if he or she is considering hurting him or herself. Certainly revenge fantasies were, I was gonna use the word popular, but popular, but not, that isn't what I mean to say, but they were very predominant when the trade centers came down because we had lots of teenagers uh, whose fantasy was, well, we're, they're gonna get those terrorists, they're gonna take them out. It's hard to have revenge fantasies against a virus. But it's the same type of response, wanting to get even. When we talk to children about COVID-19, I would say the first, the first rule of thumb is to process our own emotional response which may differ depending on the day or what you get on your social feed or what you hear from family. Um, but to be aware of what you're feeling so that you can have a balanced discussion with the children. And again, remembering that it's all about their development, not ours, hopefully we've achieved a certain level, but about their development. And we know that anxiety about COVID-19 is now a common fear throughout America after all, how could it not be? We are all experiencing it or its effects or the fallout from it every day. The challenge, of course, is not to pass our own anxiety to the children, which is not to say you shouldn't feel anxious. We're human beings, we feel anxious, but to try to be aware of it, which is the first step to coping with it, um, and not just pass it on to the kids. So it's important to be proactive, be involved in prevention and mitigation. Um, all the things that we've been hearing about and still hear about uh, all day, every day. 
with respect to hand washing and the mask and social distancing, even when uh, hopefully things continue to open up with respect to schools and um, stores and restaurants and all of that. It's really helpful and probably to us too to create an open and supportive environment where children and teenagers know they can ask questions, that there's nothing off limits. It's important for all age groups to answer questions honestly, but again, keeping in mind that the answer should be developmentally driven. Use words and concepts that they can understand and gear your explanation to the child's age, the language, and the developmental level. One of the things that can be very helpful, certainly for the school age kids as well, who do well when they're doing, when they're doing, they're, they're learning and they're doing, is to help them find accurate and up-to-date information. That really helps bind and mitigate anxiety and promotes mastery. And I, I prescribe that for the adults as well. Um, do a search, see what's happening, get the information. And be prepared to repeat information and explanations over and over again. Think about when you might have gone to a physician for a medical problem of your own, and he or she, the doctor, told you X, Y, and Z, blah, 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 and you went home and your family said, oh, what did Dr. X, Y, Z say? And you don't have a clue. You didn't get stupid. But it's hard to process these kinds of things. These are stressful, they're important, uh, and so it bears repetition. It's also always important, whether a pandemic or something else, to acknowledge and validate the kid's thoughts, feelings, and reactions. Not to dismiss it, but to acknowledge that it's real and respect it. And remember that children tend to personalize situations, for example, worrying about their own safety and the safety of their family and their friends. So what should we do? We should be reassuring, but it's also important knowing what we know not to make unrealistic promises. Let children know that there are lots of people, lots of people helping those affected by the virus and looking for a cure or vaccine. And we have to remember, children are sponges. They learn from watching us. They learn from watching parents and teachers. We are the models. I would also say, limit the amount of television and media coverage, which can be disturb disturbing and confusing. I know it's a little bit less now than earlier on, say in March and April, when that was all that was on and it became like driving past a car crash. You don't wanna look, but you can't not look and it becomes mesmerizing. But it has, it can have a deleterious effect um, because it can elevate instead of mitigating anxiety. I also want to comment that we must pay special attention to children who, before the pandemic, have experienced serious illness or their own losses in the past, because they may be particularly sensitive and vulnerable to prolonged or intense reactions um, and to graphic news reports or images of illness. So they may, they may need extra support and attention. Kids who are preoccupied with questions and concerns about the corrupt coronavirus outbreak and the disease beyond what would be natural um, and a natural inquisitiveness, but really perseverating and exhibit, exhi exhibiting behavioral change, intrusive thoughts and worries, or recurring fears about illness or death should be evaluated by a trained mental health professional. And while I know a lot of um, outpatient clinics uh, are not seeing people in person, there's a lot of telepsychiatry, including our own department here out there, and private practitioners just have to call their office and see what they are electing to do. But it's important to, to intervene. So people have asked me, what, sh what should I say? Well, for the infants, you're just gonna do what you always do and just cuddle them and sing to them and keep them on their routine. 
So an example, because I've been speaking a lot about development this evening, tell children what a coronavirus is. An example might be for the preschool crowd. This is a new germ, and we know that germs can spread from one person to another. They know about that. They know about sore throats and measles and uh, colds. For school-age children, we expand a little bit. It's a new germ, which it is, and it can spread from person to person like a cold. Now for teenagers, I would recommend asking what they already know so that you can expand on it and define and correct if need be. Um, but basically that it's a new, the new virus and this is the first time humans have experienced it, uh, which is why so many people have uh, contracted it but that scientists are working on medications and vaccines. It's also important to explain how we protect ourselves. And I'm sure that this has been ongoing for the last five months, but it bears repeating. Again, thinking development. And again, these, these are just examples. You all have different ways of expressing things in your families that I'm sure will be extremely appropriate for these, these, these things. For, so for preschoolers, when we sing the alphabet song, when we wash our hands, we make sure we wash long enough to get rid of any germs. In the school agers, we make it harder for the germs to spread by washing our hands often. We cough into our elbows, cough, cough, and we don't touch other people. And for the teenagers, it's a more technical explanation. This virus spreads more easily than other ones. So we have to really wash our hands more frequently especially after coming into contact with surfaces in public places or other people. One of the things that we've learned about this virus, um, in some many cases too late, but how could we know, is that we really have to protect people who are at risk. So for the little ones, now even though the germ might not hurt you, it might hold, hurt older people like grandma and grandpa. For the school agers, now, it doesn't always or usually make people your age sick, but it can be really dangerous for older people and people who have other illnesses. And finally, for the teenagers, well, coronavirus is less likely to make young people very sick. You can still spread the virus to others who are more vulnerable to it and could get very sick or even die. But there's older adults and people with other illnesses um, that cause them to have weakened immune systems so they can't fight illnesses as easily. But for everybody, reassure them that they are as safe as you can make them. Make special time to listen and talk. You might have special family time, family meetings, however you do it in your house. Keep explanations developmentally appropriate. Observe their emotional responses as well as your own, uh, both verbal, verbal and behavioral. And again, limit media exposure if at all possible. And why, again, do I say that? Because although the media exposure enhances timely and accurate information, it also enhances the transmission of fear and distress. So we have to have a balance. Finally, and this goes for everybody, moms and dads too, maintain a routine. I want to give special thanks to our lovely marketing and PR department who are here with me, Ms. Donnelly Corrieri and Ms. Rosalie Klee, and Dr. Joshua Morgenstein, uh, who is a captain in the United States Public Health Service and assistant chair of the Department of Psychiatry uh, at the Uniformed Services University down in Bethesda, and assistant director of the Center for the Study of Traumatic Stress, who was kind enough to share the really pretty slides with me from a talk that he gave in April. Um, I'm going to leave this slide up here for a couple of minutes because these are tremendous resources. I've called a lot of this from them. They're very basic. There's a lot of uh, information there that uh, is available for health professionals, but it's also for everybody. And that's um, why we have it there. The first one is the Center for Stress and Trauma online.org. That's down in Bethesda, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Uh, that is my one of my professional organizations. And on their 
uh, non-password protected uh, what, uh, homepage, there's a link that's called Facts for Families, and there's a ton of one to two page information sheets about everything you could imagine. And certainly there's plenty about this now. And finally, www.psych.org is the American Psychiatric Association webpage. And on their homepage as well, there's a plethora of information about uh, COVID-19 and the psychological effects and what we can do. And I really appreciate everybody out there listening. Any questions? Do you have any questions? No, not yet. Okay. I, I guess invite people for questions? Yes, I, I, I certainly will. Um, Actually, we do have a question. Okay. And this comes from um, Krista. She says, what is the best way, hold on a moment, sorry, I just had an email come through. The question says, what is the best way to have children socialize with friends during the pandemic? Oh, boy, what a great question that is. I think about that all the time. I think about it as an adult. What is the best way? Um, but how can we? So here we are in uh, New Jersey, New York, in 95 degrees in August. So I think, and again, you can always check with your pediatrician, but in all the information that I've been telling um, to give people information here at the hospital, and what I hear from some of the professional sources, children can have um, play dates, but it has to be socially distant. They have to wear masks, um, and there can't be the physical kind of touching that you might have children are playing tag or those kind of things. But if it's supervised, that's one way it, with a very small group of people, maybe three to five, um, and it would outside. Because right now we have the benefit of being outdoors. We will have to rethink a lot of this as things progress um, late fall and, and winter. But for now, we are blessed. We have the, out, the outdoors. Um, another way I think that's important to use, especially if there's a reason that the child is sick or for some reason can't do an outdoor play date. I would use Zoom or FaceTime, maybe one-on-one -on -one, uh, supervised, time limited depending on what a parent uh, recommends to their child to, to have a, a game like a checkers or a game or whatever kids do these days. I date myself. Um, but to have that contact, just seeing the face can be enormously comforting and reassuring. We have another question, and this comes from Soph. She says, do you have any advice or opinions on sending children back to school? Oh, I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have opinions and I have advice, but it might not be what you expect. I think it's going to be very important uh, to listen to our Governor Murphy says, because it's all going to come, and I'm, I'm a New Yorker, so you know Andrew Cuomo is, is my guy, but to see what our governors say and see what our options are, because obviously the school boards will do everything that they can to create a safe environment uh, with respect to distancing and cleaning and all of that. In the end, these are your kids, and you have to do what you think is right. Um, that may change as we get a vaccine. It may change if the social distancing is not effective and we go back under quarantine conditions. All of these are possibilities. And um, as I always say to people when they ask me what's gonna happen about behavior, and I say, I don't have a crystal ball. I certainly don't wanna have one on this. So I'm sorry for not being more definitive, but I think I would be irresponsible if I said, do that. Um, I think it's important to, to really weigh what the, opportunities and the options are in your school district, in your school, because they, they differ, I understand, uh, and see what makes sense for your children. Uh, this comes from another um, person, and this this question is, what is the best way to have college age, um, college age socialize? So that, that's definitely a... Oh, it's... it's it's definitely an issue. Um, and that goes for youngsters who are somewhere in their four years of college and those who 
are starting um, in a few weeks. It's the same, it's really the same thing. Um, certainly online is safest with respect to contact and, and viral transmission, which is because you're not there. If there's going to be other types of uh, socialization, if the same rules apply, those are not my rules, that's, you know, it's, it's what we need to do to be safe. And instead, the only reason I'm not wearing this mask is because Donna Lee and Rosemary are at the end of the table. This is a huge room because I sit in my office and I have residents in and out all day and I wear this mask all day. Um, and they're 10 feet away, but we have to try to, to be safe. So one of the things that might be uh, useful for college age students is um, a dedicated Zoom or a Zoom room within Zoom. I don't know how to do that. I know some people get on a Zoom call and then there's a breakout group like in professional meetings. I haven't mastered that yet. Um, but say there's a group of I don't know, uh, college age students who take a class together or have a particular interest. I would recommend doing a, a Zoom meeting of just that small group. Um, and why am I saying that? I'll speak from personal experience. I, some of my closest friends don't live anywhere on the East Coast. They're South and West. And I see them at meetings, all of which have been canceled now for the next many months. I was lucky I saw them in February. And when we all went back to our respective homes at the end of February after a week together in Florida, and half of them are doing telepsychiatry and some are not. And I said, you know, we are not harnessing what's available to us for, for us. So I took a Zoom account. And so every two weeks, we have a, a girls group, nine women psychiatrists who really care for each other, know each other for 25 years. And it's really just to talk and to support. Um, and I, and I, and, and they have told me, we find it extremely comforting and uplifting and kind of motivating. So we have that contact like we're not going to see each other in February. There's no meeting. I have one more question. Sure. And this one was, what do you say to to your child who is struggling with wearing a mask? That is a really interesting question. Um, and it's not just children who struggle with wearing masks. Uh, I think the first thing to know, or to ask if you don't know, is what the issue is. If they're having trouble, if, it's, if, if, if they're not that tight, but if, it, if they feel that they can't breathe and they're getting anxious, then I would recommend a few minutes and then longer, like a desensitization, like you would do with like a phobia. You know, I'm afraid, of, I was afraid of dogs. I was terrified and when I was a little girl and we always, I tell the story when I teach about phobias to my students, that they look at me and I don't tell them it was me until the end. There was no child psychiatry back in the olden days then. People use their common sense. We moved to the suburbs and our neighbors had a little, little, sweet little beagle, Mr. Chips, who was my first therapist. There were dogs all over the place. My parents were afraid I wasn't gonna go out of the house. So they brought him over on a leash. This dog like was scared of his own shadow, literally. Oh, pet Chipsy on the head. So I did that. Oh, that was really hot stuff. I was so brave. Then the next day and a little bit more, and then they took the leash off. And I'm a huge dog lover now. If I didn't live in a high rise, I would have a dog. But I would do it that way as far as acclimating to the mask and oh look at you you look like a surgeon or whatever if um if it has to do with being asthmatic or some type of underlying respiratory issue i would check with uh, my pediatrician and see what the what the problem is um and then that that doctor can advise you the best way um, to have your child protected I hope that was a that answered some of your questions. It's hard because we, you know, we don't have uh, the audio feedback. Mm -hmm. okay. I think that's it. It was lovely to share this information with you, with all of you out there. I hope that it was helpful. Um, we have lots of resources here at Bergen Newbridge, so feel free to call. We have uh, we have a big mental health outpatient department for all ages, and that's available. You just have to call and schedule that if that's something that any of you or your family need. Uh, we have lots of information. 
and I certainly wish you all a good rest of summer and good health.